So I am um, Karen McRae, I'm in Dorney and I'm working with Loch Alsh Community Response which is run through the Kyle and Loch Alsh Community Trust and um, I'm just um, doing a, a short term project to, to host some of these these events and also do the new newsletter for anyone that's in the, the local area. Edity is the, going to be the first one of our Zoom hosts. So hello everyone and nice that you could all be here. My name is Verity and I grew up in Glenelg and have been crafting Glenelg for the last five years. And me and my partner started a wee restaurant here in Glenelg called Yolk and we do soy business uh, and private food catering and also communal dining space um, where we try our very best to highlight the amazing produce that's in the area, uh, local growers and um, some of the wild foods that we can get a hold of here. Um, unfortunately we're closed at the moment um, as are a lot of other businesses um, but we are about to open up a barbecue takeaway um, and I'm in the midst of uh, building a big barbecue smoker out of a whiskey barrel which is pretty exciting. <laughs> um, so today we're talking about foraging um, and a few sort of preserving techniques and I'm going to show everyone um, a dish uh, that I've come up with, with some of the ingredients that I found uh, on my wet and wild forage yesterday which was pretty intense with the winds. Um, so I got into foraging about six years ago um, when I took a job with a company called the Bushcraft Company down in Oxfordshire and it was teaching um, bushcraft to uh, school kids, um, big groups of school kids and I was um, cooking over fire for that uh, and I learned, learned some uh, plants while I was there and that really ignited a spark for me. Um, in foraging wild foods. Um, it amazes me that there's so much that we, we can get just right at our doorsteps. Um, so I guess the first thing I'll say is about foraging safety. So there's a few aspects to foraging safety. The first and foremost, foremost one is to make sure that you are safe when you are foraging. Um, be 100% sure that what you are picking and go in your mouth and uh, won't make you ill. Um, the best way to do that is to um, really research um, the plants that you're looking at. Um, start with a few, get to know them really well, um, and then you can move on and, and look at all the other plants that you might have in your area. Um, secondly, um, wild plants could be a new item in our diet and um, it's important to just try little bits of wild food because they tend to be much higher in things like nutrients uh, and minerals and things like that uh, and you don't want uh, an upset stomach um, which can happen if you eat huge amounts of something before you try little bits. Um, there are other aspects in foraging, things like plant care, so making sure that um, you're not picking the whole plant. Uh, you're only taking one or two leaves from each plant or uh, one or two flowers um, and making sure that they're not an endangered plant as well. In Scotland it's illegal to dig up the roots of wild plants and so keep them in place um, unless they're in your own garden and um, then you have every right to dig up anything you want. Um, and that's about it for the sort of health and safety aspect. Uh, so today we're doing a pod dish uh, and we're looking at some items that I foraged yesterday. Um, and the first one of those items is a seaweed. Now seaweeds in our culture here in Loch Alsh are huge, so much so that uh, the Gaelic language has 40 words for seaweed which is pretty amazing. We're specifically looking at one seaweed today, which is pepper dulse. And um, if Karen would like to play the video of me attempting to borrow some pepper dulse yesterday from Sicily, that'd be great. Okay, 
think there wasn't quite enough heads up there. <laughs> And I guess I can continue speaking. So Pepper Dulls um, is a beautiful little seaweed and it's one of the oh, here we go, video. Hey. Oh, now what? <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a challenge. Hmm. Is it not sorry. Even there? I uh, I thought I'd unmuted myself there. Sorry, I'm just getting to grips with this technology. Bear with, bear with me one minute. <laughs> okay. Look. Oh, boy. Oh, okay. Oh. Hopefully, we'll have the sound this time. <laughs> Ready to, do you want me to play the next ones as well, just the videos? Yeah, yeah go for it. Wild. All right, I think that's great. Um, so our pepper dulse, um, I've got the stuff that I picked yesterday. Uh, it was a little bit difficult to hear what I was saying there, so I'll go over everything I said. Um, the first thing is when you're picking uh, seaweeds, is make sure that you go out at low tide. Uh, and this just ensures that you're picking the freshest, uh, the cleanest seaweeds that you can. Um, so I went out at low tide yesterday, had a look out at some rocks. Now pepper dulse likes to grow um, somewhere where it's really wild. It gets battered a lot by the sea. Um, so I found some rocks over by the ferry um, that were pointing out in a little peninsula um, and they were certainly getting battered yesterday. Um, now pepper dulse, I'll show you here, but, uh, is a sort of purple colour and um, it branches out so there's lots of little branches um, in the pepper dulse and what I can do is you can't quite see what's going on here today we can take some photos and um, post them on to the Facebook page. Um, pepper dulse is a wonderful seaweed it's amazing it's one of the, one of the chef's favourite seaweeds it tastes like a uh, truffle which is very exciting. Um, it's, it very much excites me anyway. Um, so with our pepper dulse, uh, we picked this yesterday. What I've done is washed it in fresh water. Um, and the way I like to store uh, things for use later is to put a dry paper towel on the bottom of the tub. Oh. 
put our ingredients in there and then have a damp paper towel oh, and lift that up and then oh. pop it in so that'll keep the place all good uh, for use it, using the next day. Oh, it's all right. So <clears throat> our pepper dolls today, what we're going to do is make a nice pepper dolls butter in its mm -hmm. with our cot. Um, so I'm going to chop up our pepper dolls. Uh, there's lots of different ways of storing and preserving pepper dolls. One of them um, is to dry it. Um, lots of people like drying their seaweeds. It's often what we find um, in the supermarkets, things like that, is dried seaweed. Um, with pepper dolls, I prefer doing this because I prefer the flavour of fresh pepper dolls. Um, when you dry a seaweed, it really intensifies the flavours. Um, and for drying, you can either use a dehydrator, which is what I've got, which makes drying very easy, um, or you can get a tray, put a dry kitchen cloth on there, spread out your pepper dolls uh, nice and evenly um, with your seaweed, and then you can uh, dry it in an airing cupboard if we still got them these days, or uh, in a low oven. So I've got some soft butter here. My pepper dolls here, uh, and I'm mix the two together, and then I'm going to form a log. Now, the best thing about this butter is that if you leave it for 24 to 48 hours in your fridge, it really absorbs all of the flavors of pepper dolls. Um, and the way I like to store butters is to roll them up into little logs with a bit of and then you can take little slices once it's nice and solid uh, and you can store that in your freezer for up to six um, six months um, and then you just take it out when you want it and um, you can use it almost like a, a stock food to add an extra level of flavour to um, any of the dishes you make. Um, so pepper dolls is and seaweeds in general are best hit between May and June. That's when they're at their best. Um, I said in the video, I don't know if you caught it, um, that you should use a knife when you're picking seaweeds, and that's because seaweeds um, don't have roots like plants, but they have hold fast, so they cling on to rocks um, with sort of root-like structure. But if you if you rip that off the plant and um, won't continue to regenerate. So if you cut the plant, um, the seaweed can regenerate from um, just a very small amount that's left on the whole fast, which is um, pretty amazing. Sorry, Ben. Uh, can I just ask a yep. quick question? Um, Amanda, Amanda is asking the the butter recipe. Is it okay to use vegan butter instead? Absolutely. Yeah. Any butter you want, vegan butter. Um, so, the next thing we have is uh, some nettles. Um, um, Karen, are you ready to play a, a video of some nettles? Yes, let me just get that one for you. <laughs> um, as far as safety with nettles goes, my biggest point um, to tell you would be to wear some gloves. Um, now, Roman soldiers apparently reportedly used to rub nettles on their body to keep themselves warm, which uh, I highly do not recommend. Um, I'm sure that's pretty uncomfortable. Okay. So let me just get this shared now. Oh, I need to play it as well.
So great, an abundant field of nettles. Um, nettles are amazing. Uh, they're very deep rooted in our culture. Again, white seaweed. Um, people used to use nettles to make um, nettle haggis, which is pretty interesting. Um, and we cook down all the nettles with uh, onion, garlic, spices, and oatmeal. Uh, wrap it all in uh, a muslin cloth and, and boil it for hours, as you do with haggis. Um, other things are things like nettled beer. My dad once made nettle wine. It wasn't very nice, um, but I was only eight at the time I tried it. Um, <laughs> so I need to try that again. Our nettles, um, most people know how to spot a nettle um, because we learn about nettles when we're really young, when we get stung by them, and the uncomfortable sensations that nettles bring. So they have a heart shaped leaf serrated edges and um, they sting. Um, they're most often found um, sort of along road edges, uh, path edges and wastelands. Um, I'd recommend not picking nettles uh, by a busy road. So plants are amazing things and they absorb lots of stuff that's in the environment around them and steering clear of picking anything that's by a busy road is, is a wise move. Uh, path edges mostly um, might be lots of dogs walking there, so steering clear of path edges and things like that as well is good. Um, but you will find nettles pretty much anywhere. Um, nettles are almost like a spinach substitute, so I use them um, kind of like I would a spinach. What I've done is uh, mix all the nettle leaves off the, the stem and wash them in cold water and again like with our other greens uh, we can store them with a dry paper towel nettles and then a wet paper towel on top i've actually left these nettles wet from when i washed them so i'm going to use that to steam them and they don't need any more water than that they just need water that you've washed them in and the nettles themselves in a hot pan so that. Right. You want to put nettles for about one minute just to get rid of the things. And once they've been put down for a minute, they can't find them, which is great. So I'm going to leave that there just now. Um, so for safety with nettles, uh, again, we, we can grow in lots of other plants, can grow in amongst them. Um, and you need to make sure that when you bring what you forage home, that you've only got what you were looking at and not any extra stuff. So here we've got our steam nettles, uh, and I'm going to pop them back in the and save them for a No, perfectly as well, I'm not going to save them. Um, from this stage, you can do numerous things with nettles. You can, again, like the seaweed, spread them out on a tray. Uh, and dehydrate them or um, pop them in your air and cover them and dry them off. Uh, and some people like to use nettles for things like nettle tea. Um, some people make crisps with them, so deep frying them from this stage. Uh, you can make fritters. Um, I like using them for making sort of omelets and quiches and things like that. Um, and I think that's all I have to say about nettles. So, Next one, this is the exciting one that we have here, and that's wild garlic. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Verity, there was a yeah. there was a question Lindsay had asked about oh, yes. making nettle soup. Nettle soup, oh yes, nettle soup. Um, so for me, nettle soup, I would keep it nice and simple and interesting, uh, which would be with onion, garlic, softening that off, and a bit of potato and some stock. I would add the nettles from this stage, so once they've already been steamed, I would add them 
the last five minutes of your soup and then um, blend to a nice puree. You can add some cream if you want, some wild garlic it could be great as well. Yeah, uh, I see that Lisa Bevins said that uh, nettle cordial is a great one as well, which it certainly is, yeah, absolutely. That's great. Lindsay, um, I, can I can see you um, at the top of my screen. You were asking about um, picking the nettles properly. Are you quite happy that that's covered? A thumbs up <laughs> or thumbs down? Yeah, I can add a little, little, little note to that. Um, picking nettles, you want to take the top, the tops of the nettles, not the whole nettle. Um, the tops are the freshest and um, youngest parts of the shoot. Um, so young nettles from early spring. Uh, and then when they get to around about July and they start to flower, the nettles can become kind of bitter and quite tough. And, and it's often best to avoid the nettles that have got to go away. I, I, can un, I can unmute you. Oh. oh, sorry. I thought I could unmute unmute audio. Oh, she's, um, you can you can get back to us if there's any more questions. Absolutely. Well, hopefully, I have some time at the end to answer some extra questions. Okay. So we'll go on to the gar the wild garlic now. Yes, please. Just to double check quickly, this is the one of you talking. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Make sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, so next item on our wild shopping list is wild garlic. And uh, I tend to find wild garlic um, in this area and it tends to be in sort of damp and dark places uh, so for me here on the west coast I mostly find wild garlic on riverbeds um, so there's some here um, we can tell it's wild garlic from its nice pointy leaves these beautiful white flowers um, and that's it so the best way to tell that it is wild garlic is to crush it up, give it a sniff, and it smells like onion or garlic or chive, um, and then you definitely know you've got wild garlic. Great. Alright, so here's the wild garlic that I picked yesterday. So the leaves are nice, vibrant green. Uh, they're pointed and they've got uh, one line that runs all the way up from the stem to the tip. Um, the best method of knowing that you've got wild garlic is the smell. So it smells of garlic or chive, and you can use it to replace those things. And um, when you've got that smell, you definitely know you've got wild garlic. So this shaped leaf and wild garlic, uh, garlic smell. Uh, the flowers are five pointed like stars and they grow in umbels, which means they grow in a big bunch together that's kind of rounded. These ones have started to go to seed um, and you can see the little green seeds there. Yeah. Uh, very small. Um, and what I do with these seeds is pickle them and also the buds before they've flowered. So in my experience here, wild garlic, like I said in the video, um, grows on riverbanks and uh, in sort of dark and damp areas, mossy areas. Um, they do also grow amongst lots of other things again. So in that video, um, there were some wood rushes as well. And, and you've got to make sure that you're not picking other things other than garlic. So it's very important when you get home and you pick a lot of things is to sort through what you've picked and double check, even triple check. You've got everything um, that you know. Um, so for me, I learned from a lot of books and also I have uh, my mentor from Galway, Galway Wild Foods, which is Mark. Uh, and he's great and he also has a great resource online um, called Galloway Wild Foods 
and you can uh, go read up about it. Um, my first foraging book is this one. I'm sure you can tell by how battered it is. And it's um, Food for Free, uh, Richard Moody. Um, it's an amazing book. I like the big size, but you can get a pocket size one as well. Um, for seaweeds, there's a good one called Seaweed and Eat It. Um, one, and that was written in Scotland, I think. Um, so it's much more uh, yeah, like focused on, on Scottish waters, which is great. And then there's some more here as well. So for our pickle for our wild garlic buds, which is going to go with our pod dish, um, I have got vinegar, water, and sugar, and a little bit of salt. And that's a very simple, very easy pickle. Now, if you're storing something like a pickle for a long time, you need to make sure that you're um, sanitizing everything you use and making sure that everything is super clean. And I do that by um, boiling my jars or um, pots and things like that in hot water. Um, so our pickle is apple cider vinegar. I like apple cider vinegar because it's nice natural, natural flavor and some water and a bit of sugar. Now, I'm not really one for sticking the recipes. I tend to buy things to uh, taste things, uh, but for your reference, it is 155 ml of apple cider vinegar, uh, 75 ml of water, and 6 grams of sugar. And then a nice pinch of salt. And you just pop that on the stove. <coughs> and then boil that all together uh, and you end up with a nice pickle like this. And yes. <laughs> um, if you're using your pickle straight away, I would recommend having a, a hot pickle. So dropping, dropping the things that you're pickling straight into warm liquid. Um, and that way they kind of pickle really quickly. If you're not pickling, uh, for use straight away, do not don't use the hot pickle, use it cold um, and that will help your pickle thing. Well, pick up the pickle <laughs> during the pickling process. Um, so, in our pickle, we put our um, wild garlic flower buds and also our wild garlic seeds. Great with our pot. Cool. Oh, um, other things I've seen people do with wild garlic is to ferment the leaves, so to make like a sauerkraut with the, with the leaves, which is very interesting. Um, you can also do the same thing that we did with the um, pepper dulse by slicing up your wild garlic and mixing it with some softened butter. Mixing it with some softened butter uh, and have, storing that in the freezer uh, for use later. And I just got a flash up in the screen there that somebody said, Well, garlic makes an excellent pesto as well. It certainly does, yeah. Um, some people even use it as a basil substitute in their dishes, so on pizzas, on uh, in pasta, and um, yeah, delicious. I love wild garlic. That's our pickle. Now, the fourth and final thing that I foraged yesterday um, was wood sorrel, and that's going to be a little garnish for our pod dish. Um, if Karen's got the video, that would be amazing. I can show you from here. So wood sorrel grows, uh, tends to grow in woodlands. Nice, nice name. Um, oh, there it goes. So this here is wood sorrel. And um, I love wood sorrel. It's very lemony in flavor, so it should go perfectly with our fish tonight. Um, it looks a little bit like a clover. 
It's got three leaves that are heart shaped. Um, on the stem, it tends to have pink at the bottom. You can see that. And the flowers, these bits here, they're beautiful white flowers. Um, with sort of purple stripes. So we've seen some wood sorrel in its natural habitat and we'll talk a little bit about it again. So it's um, got three leaves that are love heart shaped, which is nice and sweet. And they all join together with the tip um, there. This wood sorrel has been out of the sun and picked, so it folds itself in together um, very nicely, which I think is, is lovely. Its flavour is lemony to apple skin. Um, and you can use it for all kinds of things. I tend to only use it as a garnish. So in, in big quantities, uh, it's not very good for you. It's high in oxalic acid, um, which can cause some troubles uh, in your body if you have a lot of it. But one or two leaves are fine. Um, it's an excellent, excellent garnish for, for our fish today. Nice lemon and fiber, bright flavor. Um, we sometimes use uh, other types of sorrel as well to make ice creams um, and oils and things like that. And you'll find it in woodlands, so in sort of mossy bits at the bottom of the trees um, is where I tend to find it. And once you spot it, you'll see it everywhere. It's a lovely lime green vibrant colour um, and I think they're just magic. Um, so, let's get some fish. So I got some nice cod here um, from the local fishmonger and uh, get, get my holy wife, slash camera lady, to spin me around to the pan. So my pan's on nice and hot, um, a bit of oil, make sure that the pan is coated in oil. And what I've done to prepare this fish is to take away the uh, scales and also leave the skin side up out in the air for a bit to dry it out. Now, if you don't dry out the skin, you'll tend to find that it sticks uh, to your body. So, a bit of salt. Uh, Go. So when I put the pan in the, the fish in the hot pan, I tend to drop the temperature just a little bit and then uh, leave it there for a while until um, the skin is nice and golden and crisp. Okay, so all of our things for our fish today are the wild garlic leaves that we're going to put in with the nettles once the fish is cooked, some of the nettles that we've cooked. Butter that we made, and uh, I'm going to use this butter to finish off the fish in the pan. So now that it's sat for a while, it's um, infused a tiny bit, uh, it's nice and firm and easy to slice. There we go. Good. What's my pepper dose in there? We've got our pickles. Looking nice. All right, so maybe I can take some more questions. I want to the fish. Oh, you caught me out there. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> there, there was a couple of questions about. Um, things that, that have not been mentioned just now so if you have a bit of time then we can do them but if you want to leave it till the end just say as well um, so Amanda was asking for tips on picking sea buckthorn so sea buckthorn yeah uh, wonderful plant um, I've seen it described as uh, lots of fragile balloons glued to some barbed wire so it's very spiky uh, and the berries themselves are very uh, very delicate very 
Um, in the area, I've only found one place uh, that has sea buckthorn, uh, which is the Kyle Car Park. Uh, I haven't picked any from there. Um, I've actually ordered some natural coastal hedging to come into the garden, which has some uh, sea buckthorn plants. Um, sea buckthorn is usually found in sort of sand dune areas and areas that are. Yeah, sort of gravelly, sandy kind of. I'm not even sure if the sea buck or in the last year it might get blown away, but we'll find that. Always worth trying. <laughs> Okay, um, so the next question was um, <laughs> tips. Um, samphire and miner's lettuce, can they be yep. found on Sky or in the area? Yep, so uh, I found samphire um, on, on the banks of Loch Hood. Um, so that's me just added the butter to the pan and pulled it off the heat. Um, I'm going to let that sit for a bit. So samphire, I have found uh, on the of water, and it's fairly abundant. But once you find your spot, you'll, you'll probably be quite protective of it. So um, <laughs> things like samphire and stuff can be found um, in the salt marsh. That's the areas that are grassy, uh, a little bit sandy uh, on the shore. Um, so our fish here, I'm going to talk about that for a bit. Um, I've got the skin nice and golden and brown. And um, once that happens, I just turn the fish over in the pan, drop the butter in, and uh, take that off the heat entirely. And I'm just going to let that sit there until the fish stops sizzling, and then it will be totally heat for the fish. Um, I hope that answers the question. Sandbar. Miner's yeah. lettuce, I haven't actually found anywhere. Um, got a couple of friends that grow it, so we tend to be stuff that they cultivate it. Um, I do not find it in the wild yet. Sorry, I'm um, I'm keeping muting myself. I've got two two young children, two children and under four, uh, and it's come, it's getting near dinner time, so that you might be hearing them. <laughs> I promise they're not getting tortured. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that, that was all the questions I think that were submitted before, but if anyone does have any questions, feel free to, to unmute yourself and ask or pop them into the, the chat box. Um, that's fine. We've got um, about 20 minutes left, so we can finish early if you want to, or we can have a discussion if there's anything else. There was a lady, in fact, who commented, um, Joy, to say that, um, let me just find it, sorry. Might be my granny. Oh, was it? <laughs> she was making um, gorse wine from the old recipe book. <laughs> ah, yes, from the Glenelg uh, Gorse Book. Is that the Glenelg Hall fundraising recipe book? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's lots of great recipes in that. Um, I've actually never made uh, alcohol with any of my wild wines um, as of yet. Uh, I don't have any of the equipment. Um, Never done it. We've got friends here at Glenelg that does make beers and wines and um, makes some really interesting ones. He's currently making a large but beer, which sounds pretty excellent. Oh, um, and I generally, alcohol wise, I tend to make infusions, so I use vodka um, as my base. Um, and rum and buds are an excellent thing to infuse in vodka and um, so that's just before they start flowering and uh, nice green buds um, and they yeah just sit them in vodka for two to four weeks and then strain it out and then you have this amazing sort of almond bean flavored vodka which is delicious and um, i also do that with silver birch twigs so in the spring when um silver birch is just a but um, I'll go and snip all the twigs off and sit them in the bottom for a while because I've got a bag that here. Um, okay, um, so I think um, we've got 
Joanne is wanting to ask a question as well. Oh, no, I'm you. fine. I'm fine. Oh. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say it was me that uh, was making the ghost wine. I also oh, made the <laughs> Um, yes, Lisa was asking what other seaweeds can be edible seaweeds um, can also be found in the in the area. Great question. Um, so I'm just going to demo what I'm doing with these nettles and the, the rest of the wild garlic. Um, we'll and yeah, we can come back to that one. Um, so I'm using the pan that I put the fish in with that uh, lovely butter, and I'm just going to drop our nettles in there. It's back on the heat. Uh, uh, I'm going to pop a few leaves of wild garlic in here as well. And a little bit of salt. That way we're not wasting anything, we're not using more butter, we're not using you know, another pan, less dishes, great. And so, what was the question again? It was about seaweeds. All edible, the seaweeds. Other edible seaweeds, yeah. Yeah, um, so in Scotland, um, there are not any poisonous seaweeds that grow on the coast here. Um, so a lot of the seaweeds um, are very much unenjoyable, uh, but I'd advise getting uh, a book like the Seaweed and Eat It book, uh, reading up on some seaweeds. Um, other ones I like are kelp and uh, dulse, which is not the type of dulse, but the type of dulse. And there's sea lettuce and duckweed and ladder. All of these things are very delicious. Ladder rat is actually edible, but it's, it's not that delicious. So there is lots of things that you do find in the foraging world that are totally as edible, but maybe not that flimsome. And yeah. Great. Let's bring this crawfish together then. All right. So whilst I'm building this together, I'm going to talk about the flavor profile of the dish. And um, so we've got our cod here. Um, oh, it's a fishy flavour. <laughs> Tastes like the sea. Um, it should be nice and soft, and when you touch it on the sides once you've cooked it, um, it should feel like flakes are just kind of starting to pull apart. Um, for me, I love fish and garlic. I love garlic and everything you need to be perfectly honest, which is why I've used um, some wild garlic here. Um, um, these nettles are just an excellent way of um, adding a lot of nutrients to your diet. So the nettles are hugely high in um, things like iron and stuff like that, maybe so with the spinach. Um, they also add a nice crunchy, crunchy delicious flavour um, to our fish. Um, the wood sorrel I'm adding because of the lemon flavour. And um, we Fish and lemon go really nicely together. And then it's a little bit of that on there. And a little bit more of the pepper gels butter. And a little fish, a pickle. Strain that. Right there. Seeds. And I love these wild garlic pickles. They're almost like uh, garlic papers, which is, um, I love pickles as it is. And can have them garlic flavored is even better. And, and then finally, great, nice. This is some of the flowers from the wild garlic. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. That looks brilliant. Thank you very much. Welcome. <laughs> if only we were all closer. <laughs> <laughs> if I scratch the screen, will it? Can I smell it if I scratch the screen? <laughs> 
I know they have, they haven't quite got technology to where we want it to be yet. <laughs> Um, so just the, there was another question come in as well oh, yeah. from Joanne about thoughts on fungi in the area. Thoughts on fungi in the area. Um, so I'm actually relatively new to fungus um, and fungi. Um, I only started foraging them maybe two or three years ago uh, and I started off with chanterelles. Um, they're pretty easy to identify. Yeah. I've read books about chanterelles. Uh, I was shown chanterelles by people who knew the chanterelles, where the world of mushrooms is not more dangerous than plants, but um, sort of understanding the, um, the way that they grow, the different types of like um, gills or spore holes or um, you know the stem and different ways that they grow. Uh, in comparison to plants, uh, it's quite a new world for me. Um, another fungus that's a really good one for beginners is the hedgehog um, mushroom. Uh, and instead of gills or um, spore holes like uh, other mushrooms have, um, hedgehog mushroom has uh, lots of tiny little spikes underneath it. Um, and it's a very nice one for beginners because there's nothing else that looks like it. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. And then just just another. Oh, also, I have also, oh, sorry. I have also found sets of porcini mushroom in the area, um, which was that was last last year. That was very exciting. There was just another um, wee comment to say that one of the participants' mums uh, used to use seaweed in their jam. That'd be quite an Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Oh right, to set. Nice. Yes. So uh, seaweeds have algae in them, um, so they're often used for uh, thickening broths or jam or um, things like that. So your vegan gelatin is generally made of carrageen or Irish moss seaweed, um, which is abundant in the area. You can find it, and um, um, yeah, excellent tool to know is that your seaweeds will thicken things. That's brilliant, thank you. Does anybody have any other questions or, or comments that they want to, to ask just now? I mean, no. does, is it possible to put the wild garlic into oil to flavour the oil or does it not last well in oil? Um, you can put it into oil. Um, I tend to sort of avoid preserving things in oil um, mainly due to the uh, Botulism concerns. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, I get. I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a way, a way that I get around that is, um, I'll use a uh, uh, flavorless oil. Um, so like we've got some grapeseed oil here. Um, and I'll heat that up to a very certain temperature, which is 110 degrees Celsius. Uh, I use a blender and I put my green leaves in the blender. Uh, so wild garlic, it's an excellent way of using leaf, uh, leaf tops. So the, green, the really super vibrant green part of the leaves that you don't usually put in things. Mm -hmm. And it's a really good way of um, using that and blend that all together pop it in a sieve and you end up with this amazing vibrant green uh, oil that you can use to season things for salad dressings and things like that. Mm. What I do with it from that point is then freeze it. Ah, oh, okay, thank you. Not a problem. And then um, Judith has, has just put a comment up to say and um, that wild le garlic leaves can be frozen, frozen as well. <laughs> yeah. If, they, if you've washed them and they're nice and dry, uh, you can put them back and freeze them. Can I ask a question about the wood sorrel? You don't eat the flower then, it's just the leaf? You can eat the flower as well, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I just didn't show that bit because my flower from yesterday is no longer much of a flower. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Not a problem. 
so what I'm just going to do is um, I'll what we call it's cancelling the spotlight so then we can um, anyone that's talking will kind of pop up on the main screen there right. if, if, there's, if there is any other questions. Right. I think somebody said they missed all the, uh, some of the books, so I can go through them again. Um, those ones. So there's the River Cottage Handbook. Uh, this one is the Seashore. Um, the River Cottage Handbook collection. They've got loads of great um, books, ones on preserving and jams and uh, curing meats and things like that. Um, so I very much like these ones. Breads as well. Is the seaweed and eat it. That's good for your coastal coastal adventures. Uh, my favourite is the Richard Maybe uh, food for free. And there's another one called the Forager Handbook. This one's a little more difficult and quite advanced. Everything's in black and white, and uh, it's very uh, very incredibly scientific. But um, that one takes a while to digest. And another one that's a good one for starting off is uh, the Wild Food, and that's Robert Phillips, and he's your mushroom man here. Uh, so his books uh, are the best ones for sort of identifying mushrooms. Good. And yeah, this Wild wild Food one is full of like all kinds of recipes. Uh, so uh, just things like net soup, Salads, all kinds of things, pickles, sea beef and yogurt, soup, mm -hmm. lots of things. So that's a good one if you're looking for recipes for um, wild food. That's great, thank you very much, Verity, and, uh, uh, and Jenny behind the camera as well, doing a great job. <laughs> um, does anybody I'd certainly ahead? like to thank you to everyone who came along and listened to me. It's great. I mean, thank you. <laughs>